Folks, we're going to begin in about a minute here. If you want to funnel your way towards the, the front of the audience, it would be greatly appreciated. Easier to heckle, easier to see the presentations, uh, better for the video. It's just all around good. Give you another moment to get settled. So our next speaker you may have heard of. He is a senior research faculty at the American Institute for Economic Research. He received his PhD in political science from Yale University in 2003. He has been affiliated scholar with the Mercatus Center at George Mason University since 2008. He's authored over 20 peer-reviewed peer journal articles, a book titled Secessionism from McGill Queens University Press, and a biennially, biennially revised book titled Freedom in the 50 States for the Cato Institute, which happens to rank New Hampshire quite favorably. <laughs> Not because of a bias. They're very fair. They're right. Um, his research interests include fiscal federalism, U.S. state politics, and movements for regional autonomy and independence around the world. Uh, he's taught at Yale, Dartmouth, St. A's, St. Anselm College, and the University at Buffalo. And perhaps most notably, in July of 2001, Jason Sorens published an essay, tit essay titled Announcement, The Free State Project, proposing that uh, 20,000 libertarians move to a single low population state and change the state to become a free state. They chose New Hampshire, and the rest, as they say, is history. So, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor to introduce to you Jason Sorens, the founder of The Free State Project. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here, um, and uh, welcome to an another Liberty Forum. If you weren't here yesterday, I, I couldn't be here yesterday, but um, uh, it's great to be here again and, um, and talk to you a little bit about what has become a passion of mine over the last five years, and it really started with freedom in the 50 states and finding there is this one area where New Hampshire is not so free compared to a lot of other states, and that is land use regulation. So what can we do about it? What are the effects of it? And, um, you know, really, what are the implications for our state and for um, the world if we can change the way we zone and the way we regulate housing? Okay. So um, here's a little preview of where we're going to go here. So first of all, I'm going to talk about the, the philosophy here. Is it okay for local governments to regulate land use in the first place? And then, <laughs> and then second of all, what are the effects of, of local governments regulating land use more strictly? Then third, okay, defeating socialism. That's part of the, the title here. <laughs> How is abundant housing going to defeat socialism? All right. And then now what? What do we do? How, where do we go from here? And I'm going to go a little bit quickly. There's, there's some meaty data here um, that we can kind of chew on. Um, but I also want to leave a lot of time for Q&A. So if I go over anything too quickly, let's talk about it in Q&A. Um, or just ask a question, right, if I move too quickly and, and uh, you need a uh, clarification in the moment, feel free. Okay, so land use regulation and property rights. So I'm going to give you just a little bit about how I think about this, but I'm curious to, to see how you guys think about it. So um, the, the first concept that we need to think about here is the legitimate authority of local government, right? Do, does local government have legitimate political authority? Is it okay for them to, to regulate and tax us? Um, Right? We, we tend not to think that, that the federal government and very large governments really have the consent of the government in a literal sense. And if we think that's important, um, and I think that's important, then we will probably conclude that at most what they can do is simply protect our natural rights just like anyone else, right? just like any other individual. But if we thought that they had the legitimate consent of the governed, we, we would think that maybe they could do some other things. So a clear example of this would be a homeowner's association. So in a homeowner's association, you buy in, and part of the, the deed says that your property is subject to the rules of that homeowner's association, and some of that could be paying a fee to the homeowner's association, and they could regulate the use of your property. 
But that is consent. That's clearly unanimous consent because that's it's written down <laughs> and you've signed on the dotted line, right? And so clearly it is legitimate for homeowners associations to regulate your property and require a fee. Um, now, obviously, they could violate that contract that is part of your deed, and then you could, w could sue them, and, uh, and they can act illegitimately, but it's not inherently illegitimate for them to regulate your property. So what about local government? Are local governments more like homeowners associations, or are they more like countries? Well, I'm going to say that, um, that even though a lot of local governments here in New Hampshire are originally founded by the landowners in the area, that we are so far from that that they're really more uh, like countries. Um, so local governments are really creatures of state government. State government can alter or abolish them at will. Zoning authority is something that local governments never had in New Hampshire until 1926. So this is a power that state governments have given to local governments. And so local governments, I, I do not think that it's um, uh, okay for local governments to nationalize industries or, or uh, right? So like education is a kind of public sector industry uh, owned at the local level. I do not think that that is um, based on the consent of the governed. And s similarly, zoning regulations, I would say, are not based on the consent of the governed. They're not like a, what a homeowners association does. Um, they are uh, an explicit grant of authority from the state. Now, um, this conclusion is reinforced when we think about what zoning actually does. So what zoning does is it separates uses. It, it creates a map in your town, and it says... The residential is allowed over here, the commercial is allowed over here, the industrial is allowed over here. And often, you know, the multifamily residential is allowed over here and the single family residential is allowed over there. It is not regulating nuisances. So you might say things like, well, I, I don't want a pig farm to open up next to my house. And you can actually regulate that either through common law, that's one way, that's maybe the purest libertarian way uh, to regulate that is through common law, and you could sue them for creating a nuisance, right? Um, but another way you could do it is simply have an ordinance that says uh, you can't open a pig farm within a thousand feet of a house or something like that. That's not zoning. That's, that is land use regulation, you could say, but it's not zoning. So I grew up in Houston, uh, the only significant city without zoning, but it does have land use regulation. So it does say you can't open a petroleum refinery next to a house. But that, again, that is not zoning unless they said all the houses go over here and all the petroleum refineries go over here. Um, that's something different. So, um, so one of the defenses of zoning that is simply protecting our rights from nuisances, noise, pollution, things like that, um, is not really what zoning does. That's not the principal thing that, that zoning does. Now, idealism in an imperfect world. What do I mean by that? Well, zoning's been around for a long time. It's nearly universal. There are still a few communities in New Hampshire that do not have zoning. So the question is, should we abolish zoning? And I think there's an, there's an interesting argument out there for that. You can uh, find it in a, in a recent book by a, a classical liberal urban planner. Yes, there is such a thing, <laughs> believe it or not. A classical liberal urban planner named uh, Nolan Gray. Um, and he's, uh, he's at UCLA right now. But uh, he has this book that just came out called Arbitrary Lines. And he advocates zoning abolition. Um, and that's a, a, a position out there that we could talk about. But is that uh, politically realistic in our imperfect world? And what does that do to people who have assumed that this zoning is going to be in place? So let's take a zoning rule that's been around for like 50 years. Well, everyone who's moved into town has moved into it understanding that that zoning rule is there. Um, maybe that's not quite legitimate consent, quite to the standard that we would like. But it does mean that a lot of people perceive that they have a property right in what you're not allowed to do on your property, right? So they'll say, if you build a, a fourplex next door, four units in a, in a house, if you build that, you're violating my property rights. It sounds kind of weird, <laughs> and, and, and maybe they're wrong about that, but that is a perception that is very widespread out there that while well, this rule's been around forever, that you're not allowed to have fourplexes in this neighborhood. Um, and so I expected that when I bought my house. And there's not nothing to that, right? There's, there's, there is a sense that, well, okay, um, the ideal solution here would be to set up a homeowners association where all the people in the neighborhood could consent and set up the rules for their neighborhood. 
but that's going to be really, really difficult now that the neighborhood is, is developed. So to some extent, you might say that zoning substitutes uh, for that kind of activity. So I'm not taking a stand here. I'm just saying these issues are, are really complicated, and where we go from here um, is not as obvious uh, in terms of repealing zoning as it is in terms of just stopping it from going further, right? So the more land use regulations we put onto people's property, we are taking away their rights. We're taking away rights that they legitimately expected to, to have to develop their property. We're decreasing their land values in a lot of cases, and I see that as an injustice, right? Um, and so my claim is going to be here, regardless of whether, whether you think zoning should be abolished or not, and, and that's an interesting debate, and we can have that debate, we at least should stop it from becoming more restrictive because it, uh, it is unjust. All right, now, what about the effects of zoning? Should we, should we care? Like, there are some injustices out there that, you know, some people work on, but maybe they're not the biggest things in the world. I want to claim that this is a, a really big deal. So um, there's a lot of economic literature on this. It's come out just in the last few years. And I'm going to run through this fairly quickly to give you a sense of uh, what we found out about the effects of excessive zoning uh, on the economy and, and people's lives. So first of all, let's just deal with some basic economics here, uh, a little supply and demand graph that's simply meant to be illustrative. So I've got here a housing market where you've got the price and quantity of housing. Now, you can imagine that you've got two different communities and they're both experiencing the same increase in demand. So people want to move in. Maybe this is population growth or it's just a desirable place to live. People want to move there. They're experiencing that same increase in demand. In other words, people are, are willing to pay higher prices for the same quantity of housing uh, compared to before. Right. So we've got demand shifting out. Then one of these communities has strict zoning and one does not. What the strict zoning does is it kinks this supply curve. It says, okay, you want to build, it's going to cost you. You're going to be able to build less um, for every um, you know, expense that you pay. You're going to be able to build less house. Right? <laughs> We're going to restrict density. We're just going to restrict the amount of housing you can build. So that makes housing less responsive to price and less responsive to demand. So <clears throat> in this community up here, that has the stricter zoning, you end up with less of an increase in supply of housing, and you end up with higher prices for housing, right? Which we would observe in, in higher rents and maybe also higher house prices, although house prices also respond to interest rates. So compared to two equally desirable community, when you compare two equally desirable communities, the one with stricter zoning is gonna have less housing and more expensive housing than the one that has, um, that has less zoning. But zoning does not destroy housing units. So if you're not a desirable place, if demand isn't increasing, people don't want to move there, you can't increase property values by enacting zoning. Right? It's not going to help you unless you're a place where people want to live. So that's why places like San Francisco that have had, a, had an economic boom you know, 10 years ago, especially associated with tech, um, they were able to increase rents and increase the cost of housing substantially by limiting construction. But a place like Detroit could not have done that, right? People were leaving Detroit. <laughs> uh, zoning would not have wiped out the housing stock that was already there. It would have simply made it difficult to build new housing, but no one wanted to build a lot of new housing in, in Detroit. Okay, so that helps us understand then what we're going to see uh, when we look at the data here in terms of how restrictive zoning affects the housing market and the economy in general. And we see a very strong relationship at the state level between residential building restrictions, this is zoning that affects housing, and state price parities, which is the cost of living by state. So Hawaii is the most expensive state to live in. Maybe that's not surprising. It's also the most regulated state for land use, residential land use. North and South Dakota um, are the cheapest states to live in, and they're also very unregulated for, for land use, um, you know, residential land use. So it's a very, very strong correlation here, and you see a few outliers like Alaska um, that are, are maybe more expensive just because of their, their distance from markets and things like that. But um, 
but it's a it's a strong relationship. Correlation does not immediately imply causation, but it's consistent with it, right? If we can rule out other reasons why there would be such a strong correlation, you know, there's, there's a reason to think that there, maybe there is causality here. So then there are a bunch of studies out there that try to get at causality. And uh, just the short version of this is, yes, restricting home building <laughs> causes rents to go up and ho house prices to go up even more. Um, and the, the literature has shown this at the macro scale, at the level of the metropolitan area, and it's shown this at the micro scale within 500 feet of a new development. Um, so Lee is an example of a study that looks at um, uh, the micro scale, finds that a 10% increase in housing stock leads to a 1% decline in rents. Um, the effect tends to be bigger as you as you get to the metropolitan area. So if you're expanding housing stock 10% in a metropolitan area, a lot of the the research shows, well, that's more like a, a 6 to 7% decline in rents. Um, filtering is an important phenomenon here. When, when you talk to people about the need for building new housing, um, filtering is a critical component of how this works. When you build, let's say, luxury condos, who moves into those luxury condos? There's a lot of research on this. It turns out that the vast majority of the people who move into those luxury condos are people who were living in non-luxury apartments or things like that, right? So, they were, so they're moving up the housing scale. They're moving, they're finding something that is now affordable to them that didn't used to be affordable to them, and they're moving in there. And then they are opening up, almost one for one, opening up the units that they're vacating. And so those moderately priced apartments, now people who were in low priced apartments and tenements and things like that are now able to get better housing and move up the scale and people who were formerly homeless are now moving into those tenements. So it's that filtering process, it's not trickle down, it's more like flood down. Um, it's almost one for one. Yes, some people move in from out of the region, but a lot of this, what's going on here is that people are able now to access better housing than they could before. Um, low income buyers are more affected by housing costs than, than high income buyers because they spend a higher proportion of their income on housing. And so, um, so these are the ones who tend to migrate towards cheaper housing. So one of the reasons why uh, California can be losing lots of people and yet its GDP per capita remains fairly high is that the people who are left in California tend to be the wealthy because they can afford the housing costs. And it's low and, and middle income people who are moving to places like Texas and North Carolina and Arizona where there's abundant housing. Um, and so those places can often have lower per capita income, even though they are growing rapidly, showing that they are a desirable place for people to move to. Uh, so that's the reason why when we compare states in terms of how they do economically, it's much better to look at total income or net migration than it is to look at per capita income. You can be a stagnant declining state with high per capita income because you just happen to be driving away all the low and middle income households. All right. Um, so here you see uh, the correlation between net migration and residential building restrictions, and it is negative. So people are moving away from places that have higher building restrictions toward places that have fewer building restrictions. Um, this simple correlation is actually an underestimate of the true causal effect because it's the places that have the in-migration to begin with that have the incentives to then erect barriers to it, right? Remember that supply and demand graph? Detroit has no incentive to raise zoning barriers to raise property values. That's not going to help them. Um, but places that people are moving to do have that incentive, right? So there's a the causality runs from migration causes housing barriers, which then causes less migration. Um, so the, the true effect of, of, uh, of housing barriers on migration is, is substantially negative. What about GDP? Well, one um, famous estimate in the literature is that if these three cities had simply retained um, the median, the, the typical level of housing regulation of a, of a typical city in America since 1964, uh, U.S. total GDP would be 36% higher today. <laughs> wow, that's a, a big estimate. Just these three cities. Now, why is that? Well, first of all, these are, have been some of the more economically dynamic cities in terms of 
innovation and, and tech and finance, and, and they would have been places people would want to move to um, had they had, you know, housing and land use not been so regulated. But uh, also a big part of this is the miracle of compounding, right? So from 1964 on, a small difference in growth rate can then result in a big difference in GDP. So if we are thinking about the future and, and, and what our children and grandchildren will enjoy, we really need to think about um, things that affect their economic growth rate, like housing constraints. And so what we have is uh, people are moving to places where they're not the most productive. They're, they're moving to Texas and Arizona for the cheap housing. That may not be the place where all the innovation is happening, um, but it is a place where they can afford to live. And so that causes this distortion in, in the GDP growth rate. And there's evidence from Italy that's consistent with this too. Socioeconomic segregation is also something that we find with housing supply restrictions. I found this in, in New Hampshire as well, and it tends to hurt educational outcomes because school, you know, public school monopolies are based on geographies. So if you are saying to lower and middle income households, you know, basically you're not al allowed to live in this rich town that has good schools because our zoning restrictions won't let you do that, it's keeping them in uh, the worst public schools in their, in their own uh, poorer town. And so here you have a map of socioeconomic uh, residential segregation by metro area. Bigger circles mean more segregation. So that means higher income people live in high income towns and low income people live in low income towns. That's residential segregation. You find this pretty high in the northeast, the Rust Belt in California, and lower in the south, Midwest and Pacific Northwest. And the test score gap looks pretty similar. So this is low-income children scoring a lot lower than high-income children. That means a bigger circle here. And that is also the, more the case in the Northeast and California, places that have the strictest zoning regulations. Now, there are some other factors here. You know, race probably plays into this, but definitely r residential land use regulation seems to play a role here in shutting the poor off from educational opportunity. In New Hampshire, I, I found this as well. You, this is probably these are these town names are too small for you to see, but you can see this cloud of data here, and we find a small effect where towns that are richer in 2000 then increase their land use regulation over the next two decades. So the richer towns are the ones who are increasing their land use regulation more. There's a lot of noise, but there is on average some effect there. And then we have a stronger effect here where those towns that had stronger, uh, stricter land use regulation in the early 2000s then saw a greater increase in median household income over the next decade and a half. Now, why is that? Was st were strict zoning laws making workers more productive? Were they, is that why they were earning more? <laughs> no, it was that these are the towns that are not, these towns are not growing very much. Newfields, Newcastle, Southampton, Kensington, Madbury, places like that. They're not growing very much. They may even be declining in population, but the people who are leaving tend to be low and moderate income households, right? So we see that process of socioeconomic segregation happening right here in New Hampshire. Uh, fertility. So the evidence here is a little more mixed. So on balance, high housing costs seem to decrease um, family formation. So people's willingness to get married and have kids. Um, however, housing wealth does encourage fertility among homeowners and rents uh, and high rents decrease fertility among renters. So if we're worried about low fertility, another reason potentially to be worried about housing costs. All right, that brings us to defeating socialism. So land use regulation has all these negative effects on the economy. It, it distorts where people live um, and we're, we're paying a big cost for that. So what about the political consequences of land use regulation? And, and I think this is a, a really interesting area of research. So what we're finding is that among a lot of young people, it's the rising cost of living more than anything else that increases their support for sort of far left ideologies, right? Do you reject the market system and think we need, you know, we need socialism or something like that? And there are several policy connections. It's not just housing here. Obviously, monetary policy plays a role in the inflation we've seen over the last couple of years. It's eaten up our wages. Um, but housing plays a role. Healthcare plays a role, right? So you, you probably have seen those charts that show, you know, product, labor productivity going like this and wages going kind of like that, 
right? And there's this gap between productivity and wages. Well, where does that gap come from? It comes from, in, in large part, fringe benefits. So fringe benefits have gone up, but they're paying for health insurance that has become much more expensive over time. So people don't feel that as a benefit. So the cost of healthcare is chewing up people's wages more and more. Higher education as well. What do these three sectors have in common? Housing, healthcare, and education. <laughs> I mean, definitely a lot of government involvement, right? <laughs> now, non-libertarians might say, well, maybe it's the government got involved because there are problems in the market here. But I don't think that's what we actually see historically. So what was the problem with housing? Why did we start restricting housing all of a sudden? Because the market was providing too much housing, right? And, and people didn't like that, right? Like, no, I don't, I don't want all this housing near me. I want to stop it. Um, and so government got involved to restrict supply. Uh, healthcare and education, um, the, the market was providing this, um, but it was uh, doing so at, at a cost, right, to the, to the consumer. And so politicians thought, well, we could make this seem free by subsidizing these things, right? <laughs> and so they subsidized demand, and demand went way up because people were not cost sensitive anymore. So with healthcare and education, the solutions are a little bit politically trickier because it's basically saying to people, no, you need to pay more of the cost of these things so that you demand less. And, and that's not uh, a message that's easy to get to people and, and that wins you elections. I mean, it's true. <laughs> that is what we need to get those markets working better. With housing, we have an easier message to sell. It's like, get, stop getting in the way of supply. Right? We're restricting supply. We could um, get you all the housing we need if government got out of the way. And so um, there's a strong relationship, actually, between increase in cost of living and political ideology moving to the left. And I found this at the state level. I found it at the county level. I found this at the town level in New England. Um, now, again, it's a correlation. Is, is What's the causation going on here? Is it that more left-wing places are adopting more um, housing regulations? No, that's actually not the case. There's very little relationship between the partisanship of a place and how strictly it zones. There are right-wing NIMBYs and there are left-wing NIMBYs, right? Um, but what we do see is that places where the cost of living is going up, those places move to the left. And I think some of this is persuasion, some of it is lack of fertility. There's a paper out there that finds that uh, married men and women are, are more um, conservative, and as housing costs go up, uh, men and women are less likely to get married because uh, they can't really afford to. Uh, so that could be part of what's going on here. And again, I don't want to claim that, that, all of that this is necessarily socialism, but if we're seeing a left-wing move in a lot of these states... You know, that could be people moving from moderate de Republican to moderate Democrat, but it probably also indicates moderate Democrats moving all the way out towards supporting socialism. Uh, what about property taxes? What's the effect of land use regulation on property taxes? There is an argument out there that, um, that I've heard from some libertarians that we need some zoning restrictions to reduce property taxes. So it is possible to design um, zoning regulations that are intended to keep out children and therefore um, reduce your property tax burden. But is that how zoning restrictions are working now? And the bulk of the evidence shows that we've gone beyond that point. We've gone beyond the kind of revenue maximizing point of, of, um, of, of property taxes, if you will, or of, uh, of land use regulation. So it's a bit like the Laffer curve, right? So you increase tax rates for a while, you, you raise more revenue, but then you get to a point where you, you're just dis discouraging the economy so much you actually get less revenue. And that's what we're seeing here. So um, a very high quality study came out in, uh, on Massachusetts municipalities uh, three years ago in National Tax Journal, and it found that when uh, Massachusetts towns zoned for less density, they actually re reduced their property tax base so much that their property tax burdens went up. So we've gone past the point of restricting housing for, for families to now restricting so much housing that, um, that it's crushed our property tax base. And that is how property taxes work in New Hampshire, even more so than in Massachusetts where they get a lot of state aid. Our local communities are largely self-funding. 
Um, and if we squelch that property tax base and say, no, you got to leave all that land in current use, you got to leave, leave it vacant, um, that is resulting in a higher property tax burden for everyone else. Um, so here's what the abstract shows about why this is happening. Zoning restrictions hostile towards small dwellings are found to actually reduce residential value per student. This is because small dwellings, although valued less than larger dwellings, has disproportionately fewer school-aged residents than larger dwellings do. It is then shown that restrictive zoning policies through their mitigating effect on the local stock of smaller dwellings force municipalities to rely on higher effective property tax rates to self-fund a particular level of per student education expenditure. So again, when, you, when we have high minimum lot sizes and frontages and things like that, we're forcing people to build big houses with big lawns on big lots. That is actually what families buy. <laughs> when we prohibit um, the, the smaller dwellings, whether it's multifamily or single family starter homes, um, that's what retirees buy, young childless couples, singles, that's what they buy or rent. Um, and those are people who can contribute to our tax base without, um, without taking the money for, um, for schools. All right, so zoning restrictions have gone far beyond that tax minimizing point for the homeowner and are now raising our property tax burden. So what can we do now? Well, first, uh, we can educate ourselves and show where the, the real problems are and focus on the low-hanging fruit to reform zoning restrictions that really are the most damaging. And so, um, supposed to be later this month, the New Hampshire Zoning Atlas coming out from the Center for Ethics and Society at St. Anselm College. Uh, that will map the entire state, zoning districts, with their regulations for housing. You can get in there and, uh, and really uh, go to town on figuring out what your, your town does. Um, state level action may be needed, so state legislators can get involved here and there are many proposals out there, some good, some bad, some a mix. Um, there are more sort of free market approaches uh, to this, and I'm going to give you just a little bit of a teaser from the New Hampshire Zoning Atlas to show you um, some of the, maybe some of the best opportunities that, that could come from state level action. There are some neat zoning reforms that can get buy-in from neighbors. People don't necessarily have to be hostile to all new development. If you can show them, hey, we can allow for this really cool kind of development that's going to be a benefit to our town. That could involve mixed use, commercial and residential, which is definitely a big you know, benefit to your tax base. Village plans where you allow for um, you know, kind of a walkable space with residential and commercial. Again, a big benefit to your tax base. Usually looks pretty. Right? People like that kind of thing uh, in their towns. Conservation subdivisions that preserve open space in exchange for, hey, you get to, to build on smaller minimum lot sizes, detached accessory dwelling units or in-law apartments. So there are a lot of cool things you can do that I think can get political buy-in at the local level. All right, so um, one of the things that I want to point out in New Hampshire is that we make it very, very hard to build starter homes in most of the state. So a, a cheap single-family detached house is not going to be built on you know, a three or five acre lot because you're buying so much land there, it's going to be costly. So a developer is going to say, might as well make the house nice and, and expensive too. So what I've mapped here is um, the areas of the state in yellow where small lot single family is allowed. This is on less than one acre with less than 200 feet of minimum frontage. And it's only 13% of the buildable land area. So even excluding the White Mountain National Forest and interstate highways and things like that, uh, wetlands, um, only 13% of the area that's left allows a uh, small lot single family. And some of this is lack of infrastructure, lack of sewer. Like my town allows zero, zero percent of the land area as small lot single family. We don't have sewer. Uh, that may be one reason for it, although you can, according to the Department of Environmental Services, you can uh, um, have good septic on less than, than a, than a one-acre lot, depending on your, your soil type. Um, and you, we do see that politics plays a role in here, because some of these cities, Nashua, actually Londonderry is in there, Manchester, uh, Summersworth, Rochester, do allow small lot single family, and then at that municipal border... Their neighboring towns are not. So is that a, a public health or safety reason that happens to coincide just with that straight line of the, <laughs> of the municipal border? I don't think so. I think, I think what's going on there is, is politics. So there's probably more that, that state government can do to just limit minimum lot sizes and say, okay, municipalities, yes, you can, you can regulate this to some extent, but we're going to have to 
prevent some of the absurdly high minimum lot size that we see in some places. Anyone want to guess what the highest minimum lot size in New Hampshire is? <laughs> Higher than 20, less than 200. <laughs> it's 50, 50 acres in, uh, in Lyme and New London. There are districts that actually are substantial portions of town where you have to have a 50-acre lot before you're allowed to put a house on it. Wow. So, um, <laughs> right, so un unlimited local regulation of, of people's property doesn't seem to be working. Okay. <clears throat> What about uh, accessory dwelling units or accessory apartments, as they're called in, uh, in my town and some other towns? Actually, New Hampshire does pretty well here. And I think this is um, an, an interesting case where the state government did get involved. This, uh, the state government passed a law saying if you have a single-family residential zoning district, you also have to allow um, accessory apartments in single-family homes in that district. And you can't regulate them too much. So they, you can't have a, um, a ceiling on size that's smaller than 750 square feet. You can't say that the person who lives in the apartment has to be related to you. You can't mandate that the door between um, the ADU and the main house has to be unlocked. Um, so the state government was explicitly doing this to try to do some gentle density, some gentle rental housing. Um, and... Uh, and it seems to have worked. Actually, a lot of towns, now what I've mapped here in yellow, um, allowing ADUs greater than, than 1,000 square feet. So these are pretty good-sized apartments, and actually much of our land area, if not most of it, is zoned for that, including my town, which is otherwise fairly restrictive. Um, so this is a, why, why have ADUs been so successful? Well, my hypothesis is that this is a direct benefit to the homeowner. Every single homeowner now gets a right to build one of these. And the town can require that it, it look, retain the look and feel of a single family house. So it doesn't look like you're building apartments everywhere, um, but you can, right? <laughs> you can build a lot of apartments in a neighborhood because every single house could end up with one of these. Um, so this is a, a kind of a really cool option that's out there for the, the average homeowner to take advantage of, um, it is now state law that they have to let you do this. Um, and, uh, and so this is a way of, of again, increasing property values, uh, right? Because you get more land rights and you can, you can build on your land uh, and get some revenue from that. Um, so what's, what's interesting about both of these solutions is I think that they work well with the idea that... Um, you know, we, we want people to own property, right? So, I, you know, I get the, the point that if you have a society where the vast majority of people don't own any property, maybe you don't get good political outcomes from that, right? And so what we could do in New Hampshire is with ADUs and with smaller minimum lot sizes is we can encourage that, that property ownership, put that property ownership within reach, of people. And what's interesting, I don't have the, the map here, but um, when the atlas is released, you can find it. When it comes to five family, right, so five apartments in a, in a building or more, um, New Hampshire communities are just as tolerant of that, or as intolerant of that, if you will, as they are of small lot single family. So it's kind of interesting. There's not really a bias towards single family in most town zoning ordinances. Um, they're either just restrictive across the board or not so restrictive across the board. But maybe if we want to particularly focus on that starter home rung of the ladder, this is the area to focus, small lot, single family housing. Okay, so some conclusions, and let's talk about, um, let's get to Q&A and, and, uh, and see what you guys think. So in conclusion, real world zoning, the way it works, it's not really about protecting people's rights not to be interfered with by noise and light and, and water pollution and things like that. It's really just more about separating uses. Um, so uh, that is sometimes uh, something that people might want to do. And really the, the kind of pure libertarian solution to that is then a homeowner's association, right? Or a deed restriction that you agree with with your neighbors. Um, we can have a debate about whether we should repeal the existing zoning ordinances that exist but 
Stopping further zoning regulations definitely seems like a big win for liberty, both in terms of mattering to people's lives and improving the economy, increasing housing supply and affordability, encouraging in-migration, especially of those essential workers, lower-wage workers. Um, and by the way, the, uh, you know, the, the base of, um, of the Republican Party these days is not corporate lawyers and hedge fund managers and people like that who can pay the cost of high housing. Um, it's actually truck drivers and uh, hairdressers and nurses, right? Um, that is that is increasingly what uh, what the Republican base is. So when I talk to Republican NIMBYs, and there are a lot out there, in fact, Democrats tend to be better on housing issues in this state uh, for whatever reason. Um, they don't seem to get this. They seem to think that <laughs> if we only allow wealthy people to live here, they'll all be Republicans, right? Uh, no. <laughs> that's that's not that may have been true like 40 years ago but in new england it's almost the opposite of the truth now we can we can reduce socioeconomic segregation raise fertility and maybe most importantly in my opinion we can reduce nationwide we can reduce um young people's drift for, for, towards socialism if we can solve these issues like housing health care and education that are causing them to feel as if um, they're on a treadmill or moving backwards compared to their parents. Even though the data show that isn't quite true, that each new generation actually does have a higher material standard of living than the one that came before, there's a perception that's at odds with that because of the cost of these important goods that, uh, that young people spend so much of their incomes on. And then finally, we want to reduce property tax burdens here in New Hampshire, right? It looks like <laughs> relaxing small lot small dwelling zoning is a way to actually increase our property tax base and reduce our burdens, right? And that is a, a solution we can implement in any individual town. It's in our interests uh, in our individual towns to start doing that. All right, that's it for me. Thank you very much. <laughs> and yeah, uh, get in line here for questions. So go ahead, Dennis. Uh, you, you talked a little bit about the incentives, but it, it seems to me like the primary incentive of the individual homeowner is to cartelize their property, mm -hmm. right? To, to, to reduce the stock. Yeah. And they want the, they want the, the, the price to increase. Uh, how do you talk to that particular uh, uh, individual? Because that, yeah. that seems to me like, like the, the underlying uh, 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 push here. You know, the, the rationalities, okay, sure, you know, those are rationalities, but they, ju they just basically want to sell their, their property at a higher value. That, that is the big problem, and, and, and that's why we, uh, we're probably in this mess, because of that political incentive. Um, you can talk to them about property tax burdens, so you can talk about, hey, if we legalize these small dwellings, you know, the evidence really suggests it's going to decrease your property tax burden. And the other side of it is, well, okay, your, your house goes up a lot in value. Um, if you're a New Hampshire lifer like me, that doesn't make a big difference to me because I'm going to be buying. If I sell, I'm going to buy nearby, right? Uh, so, yeah, if you want to sell out and move to Florida, then maybe that's a benefit to you. But how many of us uh, does that really apply to? So those are kind of the, the messages I've, I've been trying to take in my current planning board campaign. Um, and you know, some are receptive and some are not. So it's <laughs> I'm, I'm not uh, hiding that this is in some ways an uphill battle, but um, but those are two clear ways that that homeowners could uh, could benefit from zoning reform. Uh, thank you. First, a, a brief comment uh, on the uh, increase in housing prices, moving uh, especially young people towards socialism. Uh, if you look at the bills and floor speeches this session in the uh, House, it's extremely clear that that's the case. Um, and my question is on the, on the single ADUs that are allowed now, to what extent have people taken advantage of that? <clears throat> How much have they been built out? And is there any evidence of uh, you know, a positive impact on reducing uh, housing costs or uh, reducing property taxes? Yeah, so I believe the law went into effect in 2017. And I saw a number recently that was somewhere around 5,000 permits statewide since then. Um, so that's definitely not nothing. Um, and, you know, in a lot of these ADUs, it's probably, you know, single people, um, you know, maybe a, maybe a couple or a, a single person with a kid because they're smaller, right? And, um, 
And, and so I would expect a, a positive effect on, on property tax burdens, but I'm not aware of any studies on that. I do know that Emily Hamilton at the Mercatus Center is doing a study right now on the consequences of New Hampshire's ADU law. So I would sort of stay tuned for that. And, um, you know, I would expect that this kind of law would have a gradual impact, right? It's going to take time for people to realize that, oh, this option is now available to me and for the finance, you know, the financing to get lined up and these things to get built. So, um, you know, 5,000 units is not nothing, but uh, let's see what, what it's like 10 years from now. Okay, thanks. You want to, oh, five minutes. Okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, picking off of what Dennis said, regarding uh, landlords, so when people buy homes like uh, multifamilies they're a bit more expensive but they're also expecting a, an income from it to subsidize that yeah. like through rent so if we if we de deregulate zoning and build more homes whether single family or multi landlords might see it as a problem that their their rent could go down because there's more supply finally how would one get through to them to um have them help us or, or, or something like like that yeah, that, that's that's another political problem is that um, that uh, housing providers, Jason Osborne told me we're supposed to call them housing providers now. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, housing thanks. providers may may oppose the competition. Right. This is this is, um, you know, not uh, not a new thing. Um, I mean, first of all, I would say and this is another thing I would actually say to homeowners as well. Look at what's happened with rents and house prices over the last decade. I mean, it's been, with house prices especially, going to the stratosphere. <laughs> uh, any politically realistic uh, reform is probably not going to flood the zone with massive new construction that's actually going to drive rents and prices down. What it's probably going to do is moderate the increase. Now, maybe that's bad enough for some people but i think for a lot of people what they're worried about is well i don't want to end up underwater on my mortgage right uh, things like that and i think we can assuage that concern i mean there isn't really a historic precedent for a place that's built so much housing that it's caused an absolute decline in uh in, in rents and um and housing values citywide so uh, if you have better ideas you know feel free but that's that's the one that comes to mind for me i do not okay <laughs> Hi, Jason. Um, historically, um, I may be dating myself, the educational standard of the local public school was at least a factor yeah. uh, in, in community selection. Um, if in New Hampshire there's an increase of, fo or in any other area, uh, the money following the student mm -hmm. and or the entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial uh, schooling, is that going to change the selection of community and could you see that affecting things? It's sort of a little convoluted, but it starts at I, I understand ex exactly. You, you, your <laughs> comments of education yeah. were at the other end of the spectrum. That's right. This was at the... K-12, yeah. Yeah, the, at the beginning of the, I, I choose this right. the entry. Well, I mean, it seems to me that the economic implications are obvious. So if you now th uh, believe you can rely on school choice programs rather than having to buy into an expensive public school town, um, you're going to choose a cheaper, lower tax town and send your kids to your, your school of choice, which could be a public school, could be a private school. Um, so that is going to change the way towns need to think about what, what can we do to attract demand to raise our, our property values. Absolutely. So other than the, the points that Dennis and others have mentioned about just you're competing with mm. your own stock, and yeah. I think the biggest thing that's a NIMBY issue in New Hampshire particularly is actually a commons problem, which is if there's new development in New Hampshire, it's likely going to involve blasting the, the <laughs> granite, right. right, which has damaged foundations and people mm -hmm. have no recourse in most mm -hmm. towns for the courts because of what, what – I don't know if it's zoning or why that happens, but you know their their mm -hmm. houses are getting damaged mm -hmm. in the because of this commons problem. Mm -hmm. But a bigger one even is water, yeah. and a lot of communities that have had more developments have dried up the, the, the wells. water. Yeah. yeah. So how do we deal with that commons issue <clears throat> in a, in a market solution? Because it's not it's bad right now. 
Yeah. And uh, and maybe this makes me a, a, a little more of a squish, although I, I, I do tend to think that on <laughs> on development impacts that, that are negative, that are actually harming neighbors that have negative externalities, I think that's something that's appropriately regulable, right? So um, pollution is a violation of people's rights, right? So we can, we can say that there's a, a role for the legal system in regulating pollution. I do think that some of the, the claims um, that are out there about um, drying up wells and stuff is more anecdotal than like statistically grounded, that this is a really serious problem. We have a lot of, of water in New Hampshire, right? We're, uh, we're, we're a, a, a very kind of wet state <laughs> compared to like the, the West. Um, and obviously, states with very similar hydrology, like Massachusetts and Rhode Island, uh, can tolerate a much higher population density. Now, they do that through municipal water and sewer and things like that. But w could, could we have some of those options? And maybe we can make it private, right? And so there's increasing technology out there for private um, sewage treatment uh, on a smaller scale. And uh, maybe our ordinances should reflect that and even incentivize it and say, OK, well, you can build a house on a smaller lot if you have access to sewage treatment. And and some towns already do this, but it need not be municipal. It could be a, a private um, sewage treatment option, you know, just to make this even like a pure solution. Um, so, yeah, we need we, you need some of the infrastructure to mitigate that. And, and, and potentially you can have some ordinances to protect groundwater like we want to protect you know s from salt and petroleum runoff into the aquifer stuff like that i don't have a, a big problem with that and then those are some of the things we do have to think about uh, when, when we talk about zoning last question okay rich Ooh -hoo. <laughs> maybe we can question pool the uh <laughs> the how you the slide on socioeconomic segregation mm-hmm where how does oh wait, there how does people's voluntary voluntary choice to live in a certain area affect that for example most of my family's immigrant but i also happen to be jewish now if i were coming to this country from another country i might want to be with other jews there are neighborhoods, well, the west side of Manchester is still predominantly French-Canadian. Uh, there are cities all over the place, like the city of Lowell, Massachusetts, used to be mostly Greek. Now there's a heavy Cambodian and perhaps a lesser so Hispanic. And if I were coming from one of those countries, I'd probably want to be with other people that speak my language. I might be able to afford a better home, better, or even afford something different but I'll choose to live up or above or below just because I want to be with where I'm more comfortable. Does that, if at all, affect uh, housing uh, outcomes, availability? Yeah, so some socioeconomic and even ethnic segregation would happen just because of people's voluntary choices. What zoning does is it gives people a tool to now require this kind of segregation. Um, a, a friend of mine who's not a libertarian, but a good researcher, uh, Jessica Traunstein at the um, University of California Merced, has uh, uh, an interesting book and, and some more recent papers finding that the, um, the zoning boundaries in the Bay Area of California often closely match precisely the redlining boundaries for the Federal Housing Authority when they uh, said, we're not going to allow loans to black homeowners um, in these areas, um, and they drew these maps, the zoning boundaries match those perfectly. So single-family housing is the only allowed use in places where um, FHA did allow loans, right, white neighborhoods. And multifamily housing is allowed in the areas that were considered black neighborhoods. Um, and so it does seem like zoning is now being used without explicit racial categories or socioeconomic categories to nevertheless enforce these pre-existing um, uh, boundaries between groups. Thank you. Yeah. All right, I guess we've run out of time, so thanks everyone, and I'm happy to talk with you individually if you had a question.